Rise and Shine History Buffs, it's time for another episode of Monday Morning General. Here we give you the play-by-play and analysis on battles from antiquity to the 20th century. I'm Brendan, here with Bjorn. Last week, we covered the prelude to the battle, focusing on the desperate situation in which the American colonists had found themselves just prior to the Battle of Trenton, in which the fate of the newly formed United States was held in the balance. Today, we'll talk you through the play-by-play of the battles of Trenton, and then we'll discuss the almost equally vital victory of George Washington's forces at the Battle of Princeton. So today, two battles for the price of one. That's the kind of value you get here, Bjorn, on Monday Morning General. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. It sounds like a great value. <laughs> All right. So, Bjorn, let's hit this uh, the Battle of Trenton uh, first here. So Battle of Trenton took place in New Jersey of the United States or the colonies, uh, you know, the, before the United States became states uh, in December 26th, 1776. So last time we talked about, you know, the valiant crossing of the Delaware River and then the night march uh, into into Trenton. So before I jump into like taking a look at the battlefield, is there anything you want to say before we jump into that, Bjorn? No, yeah, just uh, as listeners are following through with this, just understand these are relatively small battles. So talking about the ones that we've had in the past, we've been talking about some major uh, battles that involved thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Well, these two battles are going to involve thousands of soldiers or even in some points, hundreds of soldiers. So on a on a size, not a huge battle. These two battles are not huge, but they are incredibly significant and incredibly vital to the United States, to Americans in particular, because had these two battles gone differently, uh, you could you could make a very strong argument that the United States would not exist in the way that they currently do. So just keep that in mind as we're moving through this. They're not big battles. That's why we can afford to talk about two of them in this in this one hour that we've got. Uh, they're not huge, but they are important. Bjorn, it's pretty interesting when you think about these two, you know, relatively small in the amount of personnel and soldiers that took part. But, you know, very much the strategic value of these battles and the importance of them very much outweigh the size of the armies in, in, in play here. Next series, we're going to be jumping into World War One and talking about armies on a massive scale and so many battles that took place on both the Western and Eastern fronts, very little strategic significance and just bloodbaths, you know, yeah, huge amounts of, of human waste and uh, no, no change in, in strategy or implications into the rest of the war. It's pretty absolutely that it's it's crazy when you think about it here. We've got two very small battles, huge significance. You go to World War One, you've got monstrous battles yeah. that are measured in yards. Yeah. In, uh, the, the, de- the determination of victory is measured in feet and yards, not in miles or armies destroyed. It's just nuts. I'm excited to get to that. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's talk about the specifics of the battle here and talk about the terrain. So let's just get our eyes focused here on the area of operations for the Battle of Trenton. So the city, or would you even classify it as the village maybe of Trenton? Yeah, yeah, yeah it'd, be a village, of, it'd be a village back then. Today, it's it's, uh, it's a city. It's a capital, uh, so. It's a pretty interesting location where this battle took place. Yeah. Um, but it only really is two roads. So yeah. keep that in mind in you know 1776, two roads. So Trenton, the village of Trenton, is in the center of this area of operations, and it's where the majority of the battle takes place. To the south of Trenton and the east of Trenton is the Acid Pink Creek. To the southwest of the battle was the Delaware River. North of Trenton was open for about a half a mile until you reach a wood line, and to the west it looks like it was also pretty fairly wide open. Just a note, you know, we're looking at old battle maps, and they don't always represent all the details, but it looks like it's pretty open to the north and to the west here. All right, let's talk about some of these uh, terrain considerations. So the first one is, uh, let's look at obstacles. Three primary obstacles facing the continental attack. The first, there's about 100 or so buildings that make up this village of Trenton. Um, The second, there's a small waterway that ran right through the middle of the battle space from the southwest to the northeast called Petty's Run, uh, which was right in the middle of the town. And then third, there's a small apple orchard less than a quarter of a mile east of Queen Street. Next, avenues of approach. Uh, two main roads coming from the northwest, which uh, one's, that's called Pennington Road, and then one from the southwest called the River Road of Trenton. Uh, and both of those are coming from McConkie's Ferry, which is where the crossing of the Delaware happened. There is also a road that leaves Trenton from the south over the Assenpink Creek called the Bordentown Road. And then to the northeast is the Princeton Road that meets up with Pennington Road and goes to Princeton. Uh, 
within Trenton, there are two main parallel roads, like you had mentioned, Bjorn, that run north and south, uh, King Street on the west and then Queen Street on the east. Uh, both of those streets have a bridge that cross over Petty's Run. I'd like to get your input here too, Bjorn, but from what I could tell looking at the map, I saw two main pieces of key terrain. So the first was at the very north end of King and Queen Street. Uh, that area is like those two roads kind of come together. So they're parallel, from all, but they're kind of like they're not really parallel. They, they come together at the north end of town. Um, and that area was higher in elevation. And then key terrain two, from what I see, is Aspen Pink Bridge, which crosses over the creek in the south. And that's the main avenue uh, to get into town from the south. And it's either a place for you know, folks to retreat from or for reinforcements to enter Trenton from, you know, looking at the map, did you see anything else that stood out to you? Is like, this were, these were important places for, for someone to consider for this battle. No, Brendan, I think you got that spot on. Yeah. Uh, so at the Northern portion of the battle, you've got King street and Queen street. They're coming close together. Uh, not quite parallel They're They are a little off angled. So they're actually really close the geomet- together. The, the geometric term for what that those yeah, it's like a, it's lines like a is. triangle. I don't know. Yeah. Sure. But but at the tip of this triangle, you've got uh, an excellent position where we're going to see Washington and his his army uh, set up their artillery. And so they're going to have an absolutely phenomenal field of fire shooting down these roads. Yeah. And that's going to be a key point to American victory as we're moving forward is the fact that the American artillery is just going to dominate the Hessian artillery. But then you're absolutely right in that last portion where you're talking about the bridge down there at the southern portion of the battlefield. Uh, and this is where uh, Sullivan, his division is actually going to basically make a sprint to that bridge to ensure that they close that escape yep. hatch. That is basically the only other avenue in which the Hessians would be able to retreat or in which reinforcements would be able to to make it to this battlefield. So you've got Washington basically preventing any reinforcements or any escape from the north. You've got Sullivan and his division moving to the south in order to cover that bridge and you're absolutely right. Those are the two incredibly vital mm-hmm. avenues of approach in which this battle is going to take place. Next, we'll look at observation of fields of fire. And Baron, you already mentioned it. You know, the, where, where Key Terrain 1 was at the north end of town where King and King Street or King and Queen Street come together. Uh, that is the place that provides great avenues and or uh, observation and then fields of fire down King and Queen Street. And, you know, even just getting a little bit of a rise uh, over your, your opponent just give you that much more... Uh, power in your artillery and and you know light infantry but you know artillery over longer distances here in the revolutionary war so that that was a key spot for washington to emplace his artillery there then lastly here for terrain we'll look at cover and concealment and like we said earlier those hundred buildings and then there's like some fences that are crisscrossing through trenton uh those are the primary places to find cover uh it is also winter time so there's not like a ton of vegetation around uh, so the, the, the concealment wasn't really there. So you're mostly relying on on those buildings in town. Um, the apple orchard is going to provide some concealment. Uh, but again, like there's no like leaves on the tree. So it's, just, you know, it's it's pretty easy to see stuff. And I, I don't think it was like, you know, snowing too hard or anything. So that's kind of what we have for the terrain there, Bjorn. Is there anything else that we need to say before we just talk about like who's actually fighting this? No, no. I think that right. this is let's move on here. Cool. So let's talk about the order battle really quick. And order battle is like, you know, the, the structure of the armies here. So for the Continentals, uh, they had about 5,400 soldiers on their side. They're organized into two divisions. So there's Green's division with 2,690 men. And that's also where Washington rode. Uh, Green had four brigades and each of those had three to four regiments. And those guys are going to be approaching from the north. From the north, yep. And then we have Sullivan's division with 2,600 men as well. Or like 2,600, yeah. And then he's got three brigades, and each of those has about four to five infantry regiments. And he's coming from the south down River Road. Yep, and his his uh, objective is to, to cover that bridge. Yeah. Next is the artillery brigade led by Colonel Henry Knox. Seven artillery batteries, each with two to three guns. They have 16 guns in total. And then there's the Philadelphia Troop of Light Horse, 25 cavalry, led by Captain Samuel Morris. So it, ridiculous that we're con- we're counting 25 men yeah. as, as an individual unit that needs, needs That's to how be small recognized battles. here. Yeah. All right. Next, let's talk. Oh, any, any, any other comments here on, on the Continentals? Pretty nope. straightforward. You know, yeah, a lot of infantry, a couple, a couple guns, a couple horse. Uh, so the Germans. Uh, so the German Hessian Brigade, commanded by Colonel Johann Rahl, uh, he has 1,354 men, which is like half of what Washington has. Three infantry regiments, six artillery guns. 
He has got a detachment of 50 Jaeger. Uh, Jaeger was a term used to describe like skirmishers, scouts, sharpshooters, runners, basically think like German huntsmen, right? Like rifles, uh, they can, they're sharpshooters or rangers. You know, that was another word that they use was rangers here. So that's the Jaegers, um, the masters of the hunt, right? Jaegermeister. Here we go. That, you know, beer that disgusting black <laughs> liqueur. Uh, and then also uh, with the Hessians was the British 16th Queen's Light Dragoons, 18 cavalrymen. <laughs> another large number there, 18. <laughs> So that's the Just battle. The, like, that is it. It's 5,400 versus 1,354. Uh, pretty good odds here for Washington. Like we've said before, you know, the U.S. Army right now, you know, like when you're going on the offense, you want a 3-to-1 ratio, and uh, Washington has the 3-to-1 ratio here. So let's get into the battle narrative. What actually happened on that day in December 26, 1776? Yeah, Brendan. So just real quick, well, before we kind of dive into it, it's important to remember that, yes, George Washington has 5,400 men. He's up against 1,354 Hessians and, and a couple British cavalrymen. But remember, the Germans are professionals. Mm-hmm. The militiamen, the Continental Army, they're not yet professional. They're as professional as we can get, but they've been in the field for about a year. Uh, and so when you're talking about, I don't think three- Washington. I don't think the the Continentals at Trenton had a lot of militia in them. No, no, but, but they these, still, but they still are very inex- yeah. inexperienced compared to the German Hessians. Yeah, these dudes, yeah. these dudes are not not at all professional. Yeah. And so when we're talking about it, yeah, we have a three to one advantage here, but it's probably more like a two to one yeah. when you're ta- when you're taking it all into account. But as we're looking through this, the Americans, the Continentals, really do an excellent job of suppressing. The Hessian fire, they do a great job of overwhelming them with their massed attacks. Uh, And so as we're moving through this battle, let's keep that in mind and just see how the Americans were able to uh, essentially decimate this this Hessian force uh, and take incredibly minimal Mm -hmm. casualties in the meantime. So uh, 8 a.m. morning of December 26th. So George Washington, his men, they crossed the Delaware River that night on the 25th. It's cold. It's not the actual picture that everyone has seen. That is not the Delaware River. If you've ever been to that position on the Delaware River, it is not very wide. And it is not it is not the the kick the big ice cubes away with your with your uh, your bayonets or whatever. Your bayonets and your <laughs> rifle butts. It's yeah, not yeah. the same thing. But it's important to remember that Colonel Rall, the the Hessian at the time, he should have done a better job of getting his men prepared. They were talking about his engineers had requested that they build some redoubts and and better their position. And he didn't do that, but he did have some outposts. Okay. So about eight o'clock in the morning on December 26, Washington is going to lead an attack on one of those outposts uh, that had been set up by the Hessians. It's on that Pennington Road, about one mile northwest of Trenton. So remember, the the uh, George Washington and the Americans are moving from the northwest, going southeast in order to try and get to Trenton. Uh, the Hessian commander at the outpost, is his name's Lieutenant Andreas Winderholt. Uh, he's alleged to have been the first person to see the enemy, and he's going to shout in German, Der Fiend, which means the enemy, right? So he's apparently, according to the story... The, the guy in command of the outpost is the one who actually sees the the Americans coming, which doesn't bode very well for all the other Germans who are supposed to be on guard duty at that point in time. I'm just picturing, you know, in the U.S. military right now, like you have like a second lieutenant and, you know, it's like a young 20, 22, 23 year old buck, you know, right out of school. The enemy. <laughs> yeah, he's probably <laughs> frantic. Yeah. So you see other Germans, they come out of the, the outpost. And the Americans are going to fire three volleys at the Hessians and the Hessians are only going to be able to return one volley at their, of their own. Now it's, you're you're looking at incredible. It's incredible is absolutely accurate. You're looking at a musket or in our case, many of our men had rifles and that's going to take between 20 and 30 seconds to reload if you're good. And the fact of the matter is that the Americans are going to get three rounds, three shots off before the Germans get one. That that's pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. So uh, Washington's going to order his uh, there's Edward Hand's Pennsylvania riflemen and a battalion of German speaking infantry to block the road that led to Princeton. OK, so we're going to make sure that no reinforcements can come from Princeton, but also that no one's going to be able to escape via that avenue. There was an outpost there as well. So you had two two Hessian outposts. Both of them are going to be engaged at that point in time. Uh, Vieter Holt, that lieutenant, he's soon going to realize that this is way more than just a little raiding party. 
Uh, he's going to see the Hessians from the other outposts. They're uh, moving towards Princeton. They're going to retreat as well. And he's then going to order his men to withdraw as well. Now, one very impressive thing is that both Hessian detachments are going to make an organized retreat. Okay, they're going to they're going to fall back in good order, firing as they go. Uh, on the high ground there at the northern end of Trenton, they're going to be joined by the duty company from the Lossberg Regiment. They're going this to engage is, the we'll, Americans. We'll just put, a, put a pin in this, everyone, you know, listening. Uh, this is what a organized, disciplined army does when they retreat, right? They fall back piecemeal and, you know, they return fire. We're going to talk about another retreat uh, in a little bit later in this episode, and it's not going to be looking like that. Oh, it's going to be embarrassing. Super embarrassing. <laughs> so... The two outposts, they're withdrawing. They're moving southeast. They're met by a duty company, the guys who were ready to go on on their arms that evening into the morning. They're ready to go. Uh, they're from the Lossberg Regiment. They'll engage the Americans. They're going to retreat slowly because, remember, they're outnumbered significantly. But they're going to continually keep up a fire. Uh, they're going to use their houses for cover as they are falling back. Once they get into Trenton, they gain a covering fire from other uh, Hessian guard companies on the outskirts of town. So the Germans during this entire time, they are accumulating their forces, right? They weren't ready. They were surprised, mm -hmm. yes, but they're going to, in good order, uh, organize their forces. All right. So you've got another guard company near to the Delaware River is going to rush east to the aid of these of the Lossbergs, uh, leaving open the river road into Trenton. OK, so this is going to be a problem. The River Road, remember, that's where Sullivan's men are going to be moving to block the bridge. So interesting to think of what would have happened if that guard company would have stayed on that mm. road and held it. But still, man, the guard time, company versus a whole division. That well, It, it would have probably time, been a little bump in the road, but it stopped them a little bit. But You know, many, many portions of history, many battles, the outcomes of them were just a couple of very, very yeah. ard ardently held positions by a few really good men. And so in this instance... If they would have held it, you know, look at the Minnesota, the first Minnesota at Gettysburg. General Winfield Scott says he needs five minutes and the Minnesotans bought him 10. And that's that was the end of the battle right there. Put the nail in the coffin for the Confederacy at that battle. But we'll save that one for another story. Yeah. A few good men could maybe do something here. So Washington orders the escape route to Princeton to be cut off. He's going to send infantry in battle formation to block it. Artillery is going to form at the head of the King and Queen streets. They're going to be able to fire straight down these roads. Amazing, amazing mm. avenue yeah. uh, in which we can send send rounds downrange. And then leading the southern U.S. column, uh, you know, on that river road is General Sullivan. Uh, he enters Trenton by an, the abandoned river road and blocks the only crossing over the Assapin Creek to cut off the Hessian escape, right where that bridge was that we talked about on the southern end of town. Sullivan briefly held up his advance to make sure Green's division had time to drive the Hessians from their outpost in the north. So that's another thing to consider, too, is like, you know, it's pretty, pretty cool that they were able to coordinate their movements. I, I think they could probably see each other, but, you know, to kind of go lockstep, you know, together instead of like getting way out in front of each other and creating a scene. Yeah, it's definitely not something that happens regularly in olden times where there are yeah. no radios. There's no, it's only visual and, yeah. you know, you get to hear like, the round. Like you said, off. this battlefield's pretty small, so you, they could see each other. Yep. Uh, soon after, uh, they continue their advance, attacking the Hermitage, uh, home of Philemon Dickinson, where 50 Jaegers under the command of Lieutenant von Grothausen were stationed. This lieutenant brought 12 of his Jaegers into action against the advance guard, but had only advanced a few hundred yards when he saw a column of Americans advancing to the Hermitage. Pulling back to the Hessian barracks, he was joined by the rest of the Jaegers. After the exchange of one volley, they turned and ran, some trying to swim across the creek, while others escaped over the bridge, which had not yet been cut off. As Grain and Sullivan's columns moved, pushed into the town, Washington moved to the high ground north of King and Queen Streets to see the action and direct his troops. By this time, U.S. artillery from the other side of the Delaware River had come into action, devastating the Hessian positions. So this is something that's really interesting to me. If you try and put yourself in this position, do the Hessians at this point in time know that they're up against a massive force, overwhelming amount? Because these Jaggers, they didn't hardly even get involved in the battle before mm -hmm. they decide that it's over. That's a good question. I don't think they did. Um, you know, there's the, uh, there's the, the old... American propaganda slash story of all these Hessians being drunk. Uh, I don't think that was the case. Um, I think that's been kind of debunked by historians, but they were still 
like they weren't expecting Washington to attack with two divisions here. And, you know, and it seemed like this attack happened pretty quickly. Like it wasn't well, a lot of like build up time. And I suppose when you hear rifle rounds and musket rounds coming from your left and your right at the right. same time, you start to get pretty panicky and think, yeah, and hey, then artillery from the North and the South then, you know, with right. those, with those cannons opening up from across the Delaware from the Southwest. Yeah. So that, that kind of, uh, that, that scary a little bit, I think. All right, so now we're gonna we're gonna be forming up here. We're gonna see the Hessians form their lines. Uh, with the sounding of the alarm, three uh, Hessian regiments begin to prepare for vet, for battle. So these there are three regiments. They're getting ready to fight. They're running out to their you know they're getting into their lines. The raw this, this regiment is all units that the raw has. So this is it. This is the German units here. Yep. So we've got two divisions versus three regiments. Obviously. Yep. The divisions far outnumber as we've talked about it, but the raw regiment is going to form on Lower King Street along the with the west. Lossberg regiment. Yep, that's on the west. the The Kipthausen regiment is going to form on the lower end of Queen Street, so that's on the east. So yep. these these two or the two regiments on the west are going to be pointing north, uh, and then you've got one on the west on the east. That's the the Kipthausen regiment that's going to be on the east on Queen Street. Lieutenant Pale, Rawls' brigade agent, woke his commander who found that the rebels had taken the V of the main streets of the town. So remember, the V, that's where the two streets kind of meet. Mm -hmm. They don't quite meet if you look at the map, but they're very close. We're within 10 yards. They turn. They make that V portion where the Queen and King Street meet. This is where the engineers had recommended. So the German engineers... Wait a second. So Colonel Rawl was still asleep at like... It must have been like 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's... I don't know any colonel that sleeps that late. Oh, I've known a couple colonels. (laughs) No names. (laughs) Oh man! Oh man! Colonel Rollo, you know, taking the taking the easy day off, maybe. Yep, yep. So, (laughs) the German engineers had recommended building a redoubt in that position right there. Imagine had they done that, it would have been nearly impossible for Washington to set his men up there in the amount of time that they were able to do so. Oh, like Um, yeah, like it'd be so difficult to get artillery in there. Right. Like oh, that's yeah. where he put his, his cannon. And if you build out a readout and put, you know, fortifications there, like that makes it really difficult to maneuver, you know, the horse towed cannon into position if there's fortification. Yeah. So Raul Oversized. orders his regiments to, to form up on the lower end of the streets. The Lossberg regiment prepares to advance up Queen Street. The Kipthausen regiment to stand by as a reserve as Raul is going to advance up King Street. OK, so we've got these two regiments are going to be moving up. We've got one held in reserve. U.S. Cannon, stationed at the head of the two streets, comes into action really quickly. Uh, in reply, Rawl is going to direct his regiment, supported by a few companies of the Lossberg Regiment, to clear the guns. They've got to get those out of there. The Hessians' form ranks begin to advance up the street, but their formation is quickly broken by U.S. guns and the fire from Mercer's men, who had taken houses on the left side of the street. So the Hessians are going to break ranks. They're going to flee. Uh, Rawl's going to order two three-pound cannons into action. He's going to get six rounds off from each of those cannons in just a few minutes. But by that point in time, half of the Hessians who are manning these guns are going to be killed by U.S. cannon. So, again, another excellent example of American forces decimating the field with their with their accurate fire and their consistent fire, which is something that's really impressive when you're talking about an army that's been in the field for less than a year. Uh, the men are going to flee to cover. Behind I, I will say, like, when we say, like, half of these artillery men are killed, it is the artillery men of three guns, basically. Like, so you're talking about maybe, like, you know, 12 to, to 20 soldiers, actually. So it's not like this huge loss of life. Still, you know, it's a it's a big impact to to Rawls plans here. But it's not a not some, you know, in terms of other battles, it's not a, a large amount of people. Well, and when you think about these cannons, so you're like, well, what good are these cannons? Now, these things are massive in their capability, the firepower that they can bring to the game, because these cannons are going to be firing grape shot straight down the road. Mm -hmm. And that's like having 50 muskets all at once, just firing straight down. So how far do you know off the top of your head how far these can shoot? Um, so, I mean, you're talking it's about great. like a, th- a three pound cannon is going to be able to go a really long ways if you're firing solid shot. Yeah. Grapes are not going to go as far though, right? Yeah. The, the grape shot's not going to go as far. Grape shot is kind of like big old ball bearings right. being fired down. And like so deer those slug, ones are no, like a like deer shot, like a, like really huge buck shot. Yeah. But then you've got, uh, 
canister rounds. So you've mm-hmm. got three main different types of artillery rounds. You got the solid shot, you've got the grape shot, which is like I said, big old ball bearings. And then the last one's canister and a canister is think of like a tin can, like a soup can filled with marbles. And yeah. that's like the modern day uh, bird shot out of a shotgun. So you basically bird shot, buck shot and slugs. So it all kind of depends and they've got differing ranges, just like in a shotgun, you'd have, you know, your slug goes a lot farther than your buck shot, which goes further than your bird shot. I think by the time that this happened, these cannon are like a, less than a quarter of a mile away from each other. Oh yeah. They're very yeah, close, so they're to, each close other. to each other. Yeah. The so I'm just like trying to like, yeah, like, like you said earlier, like this is a close in fight. Uh, these, these dudes are pretty, pretty close to each other here. Yeah. So once half of those Hessians are killed, uh, the, the rest of them are going to turn and they're going to run. Uh, and you know, who can blame them? Right. right, right. But as soon as they start to run, their cannons are actually going to be captured by the Americans. The Americans are going to turn those things around and they're going to, uh, you know, they're going to send more advancing down King Street. OK, so the Americans now have three more cannons or actually not three, two three pound cannons uh, on top of the 16 that they had on top uh, along with it that they had. That's brought. a big get for them here, too. Oh, yeah, it's huge. Yeah, Every it's cannon huge. counts at this point in time. Right. All right. Uh, over on Queen Street, uh, all Hessian attempts to advance up the street were repulsed by guns under the command of Thomas Forrest. Uh, I tried to look this guy up. Couldn't find any information about who this who he was. You know, just a little interesting on on the last name there. Uh, after firing four rounds each, two more Hessian guns were silenced. One of Forrest's howitzers was put out of action with a broken axle. The Niephausen regiment became separated from the Lossberg and the Rawl regiments. The Lossberg and Rawl regiments fell back to a field outside of town taking heavy losses from grape shot and musket fire. In the southern part of town, Americans under the command of Sullivan began to overwhelm the Hessians. John Stark led a bayonet charge at the Niephausen Regiment, whose resistance broke because their weapons would not fire. Sullivan led a column of men to block off escape of troops across the creek. All of their weapons didn't fire? Yeah, (laughs) so there's going to be some like malfunctions. You're talking about differing. Uh, The question is, why, why in the world do these things not work? Uh, you've got potentially the weather that you're running into. You've got yeah. uh, potentially flints that are breaking. Uh, essentially, what would happen is as these battles would progress, people's weapons would go out of action. Yeah. But this is at the beginning of the battle. So there may have been some uh, serious maintenance issues with these guns. The other, like that last thing I just said was Sullivan leading a column of men to block off the escape. So he, Sullivan's taking the bridge and now he's you know kind of stretching out his line uh, of men up here to the east and northeast uh, to kind of cover this curvature of the Assapin Creek. Cause this is the only way for people to, or for the Hessians to retreat now is to swim across this Creek. So now he's kind of, you know, fanning out um, and basically like starting to become a development of the Hessians. The Hessians in the field attempted to reorganize and make one last attempt to retake the town so they could make a breakout. we decided to attack the U S flank on the Heights North of the town. Rawl yelled, forward, advance, advance, and the Hessians began to move, with the brigade's band playing fifes, bugles, and drums to help the Hessian spirit. Oh, well, that's that's super, you know, patriotic of them. But Washington is going to be on the high ground. He's going to see these Hessians approaching the U.S. F- uh, flank. It's a good I mean, move I'm on his good part. on the Germans here, though, right? Like, you know, they are vastly outnumbered, and still, like, we're going to come together. We're going to try to do another attack. Like, these these dudes seem pretty real in their ability to conduct military operations. They just don't have the numbers. Oh, for real. Yeah. And also take into account that these dudes are mercenaries. Yeah. Like, what do they care whether the United States wins or whether the British yeah. win? They're not going to get a piece of this pie. And so the fact of the matter is you'd regularly see mercenaries. As soon as things get tough, they would turn and run. They'd be mm-hmm. done. They'd be out of the game um, because money doesn't work well when you're dead. Uh, yeah. as we saw at the fall of Constantinople. But um, the two Hessian regiments begin to march towards, they march up King Street. They're caught in the U.S. fire, came from three different directions. And the Americans have taken up defensive positions in t- inside houses. They're going to reduce their exposure. That's that cover and concealment. Mm-hmm. Some American civilians are even going to join the fight against the Hessians. It's like, come on, dudes, jump on. Let's mm-hmm. do this. They're jumping on the bandwagon. Uh, But despite this, they continue to push and the Hessians recapture their own cannons, the Mm. two that they had lost. 
Like that's pretty awesome on yeah. their part. They get to the head of King Street. You see Knox is going to be up there. So you're, you're talking about the very north end of King Street where the American cannon are. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So Knox saw that the Hessians had retaken the cannons. He's going to order his troops to take them back. So six men run and after a brief struggle, seize the cannons again, turning them on the Hessians. Uh, most of the Hessians unable to fire their guns still. The attack stalls. Uh, the Hessian formations broke. They begin to scatter. Rawls is going to be mortally wounded. Washington led his troops down from the high ground while yelling, March on, my brave fellows, after me. Most of the Hessians retreat into an orchard. The Americans in close pursuit, quickly surrounded. Hessians offered terms of, were offered terms of surrender, and they are going to quickly agree to that. Uh, you know, uh, when you're thinking about it, why in the world are these weapons not firing? Maybe, maybe they ran out so quick they didn't grab their ammo. Maybe they didn't have time to reload after firing. Yeah. Because remember, that takes time. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons. I was actually looking at it, trying to figure out why, uh, what the problem was. But I mean, it could have been like, yeah, flints. It could have been like wet, um, you know, the, the the patches that they put in there. The powder could have been wet. Like, yeah, and that's so what I'm things seeing. Go wrong. That's what I'm seeing right here. It basically said that uh, due to exposure, a lot of the mm. weapons were not capable of firing. So Especially like think like you're a, you know, surprise attack in the morning. You're not really ready for it. And you don't do the things that you would normally do before battle to keep your kit dry and, and you know, well uh, maintained into the, the battle day. So that makes yeah. sense. Yep. So although ordered to join Rawl, the remains of the Niephausen regiment mistakenly march in the opposite direction. They tried to escape across the bridge, but found it had been taken. The Americans quickly swept in, defeating a Hessian attempt to break through the lines. Surrounded by Sullivan's men, the regiment surrendered just minutes after the rest of the brigade. Yeah, so so there you go. The the entire, almost the entire Hessian regiment, the force that was there, uh, bagged all at once. Hmm. So if we're going to, let's take a look at this. I want to analyze a couple of the tactics or the strategies. What if the Hessians get paid while they're like prisoners of war? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Mm. Now, actually, a lot of the Hessians are going What's to... What's in the contract? Yeah, they're going to desert. You were going to see a an actually like a far uh, more significant number of German Hessians are going to desert from their regiments than any other, than the Americans, than the British. They're going to, they're going to desert at a higher rate. And because mm. there's a lot of really great land here in the new world and these Hessians are going to look around. And they're going to say, "Hey, I want, I want to get a piece of this." And so they're just going to up and leave, and and find some land mm. here in the New World. So kind of cool. Um, so Brendan, when when I was looking at this battle, I was trying to think of like some key, some key themes uh, oh, that yeah. helped the Americans win the battle, or some oh, errors. Oh, yeah, some analysis. Had. That's amazing. Yeah. So so I trying to anal- analyze it here. One of the big things analyze. that I think of <laughs> analyze. There you go. Uh, <laughs> surprise. Yeah. You know, I think that I think that that has to be the number one bullet point here, because although the the Germans had been warned of a potential ap- attack, they failed to seriously acknowledge the threat and they failed to prepare accordingly. They had the engineers were saying we should build a redoubt here at the at the V of the King and Queen Street. We should have better fortifications. We should be ready. And they had also received warnings saying, hey, mm. be ready for a raid. Remember, uh, there yeah. was the one the the one raid that occurred early on and Washington was actually really angry when he yeah. saw those dudes. He's like, you may have just ruined this for us. Um, you know, so surprise definitely played a huge part in our success here, because if if he if Rawl had not been surprised, I can almost guarantee you that it would not have been, you know, 5000 Americans versus 1350 Hessians. Like, I'm not going to let myself get in that position. If yeah. I knew they were coming, I'd be gone. You know, I'm not going to try and I'd be gone or I'd be in a better defensive position than I was in, was in previously. Yeah. So. And to that point, I think that that is spot on, Bjorn. And according to U.S. Army doctrine, characteristics of the offense, a surprise is one of the four main things that offense needs to be successful. And yeah, Washington nailed it here. Um, so yeah, you surprise your enemy and you, you know, get them off guard. Uh, it makes your job a hell of a lot easier uh, on the attack. Yeah. And then, you know, when we're talking about on the attack, I was impressed by the momentum that the Americans had, mm-hmm. you know, usually in battle, you see that the momentum 
kind of changes hands every once in a while. Um, the nation that holds momentum many times is going to be the one that comes off victorious. The Hessian forces never were capable of rallying their forces effectively, nor were they able to take back the initiative that the Americans possessed, right? Yeah. They did a really great job of falling back in good order. They were able to you know, rally their troops again. They were able to push up King Street. They were able to push up Queen Street, but it never, it never seemed as though they had the initiative. They never had the momentum that was needed to carry the day. They caught, they got their two cannons back and then they quickly lost them again. Yeah. So I think so that kind of goes back to how, like, so another characteristic of the offense is tempo and Washington, Sullivan and green all were very quick in making decisions to counter those, you know, momentary times when the Hessians would try to, uh, you know, go back on the momentum. Uh, so every time that the Hessians tried to, you know, form up to do another attack, uh, they're stymied right away. Uh, and it just like was this really quick decision making by uh, continental leadership to not allow the momentum to swing back over into the Germans favor. So yeah, it, it was all about like, yeah, how quickly can you make decisions and, and turn tides of the battle back in your favor? Um, the, the fact that the Americans were able to surround the Hessians, there was no escape with mm-hmm. Green's division in the north and Sullivan in the south cutting the bridge. Uh, the Hessians had no escape. We bagged the entire lot of them there by surrounding them. Uh, the Americans were able to utilize excellent cover from the buildings while the Hessians are attempting to regroup. They're going to be able to utilize that avenue up and down King Street and Queen Street using the cannons. Wonderful field of fire. Uh, and they're also going to successfully fire off numerous valley, volleys where the Germans are going to be significantly slower in their fire. Mm-hmm. Um, so just the fact of the matter that that we were so much better capable of of suppressing the enemy's fire, keeping that tempo like you had said, uh, surrounding them, bagging the whole lot, surprising them. Uh, all of those really, yep. in my opinion, played played very well into the Americans' hands and the fact that they were able to have such an outstanding victory on this day. Yeah. So I think, you know, you got to give a little bit of a credit to the other guys. Yeah. Uh, so what I what I kind of looked at the with the Hessians, they attempted to get their artillery into position. They're unsuccessful as the American artillery had an excellent field of fire down the roads. But the fact that they were able to have uh, an, an offensive in the face of such withering fire that actually captures their cannons back. That's impressive to me. Mm-hmm. To the what the French would call Elan, the spirit of the offensive um, then the Hessians professional army, they're able to withdraw numerous times in good order. This entire battle is taking place and not once is there a single route of a mm-hmm. unit that cannot be stopped and rallied back to fight again. Um, so Rawls men, they fail to regroup enough to force a breakthrough and they're going to be forced to surrender. But I think it's very impressive the fact that they were able to fight the fight like they did and continue the battle with the amazing mm-hmm. odds that they were up against. Mm. All right. Casualties uh, for the battle of Trenton on the American side, we had seven, two dead from exposure and then five wounded. So that, no one actually killed in combat. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Wow. So such a devastating, such withering fire that the mm-hmm. Germans were not capable of killing any of them. But here's one thing that I found really cool, Brendan, a uh, cool piece of history. One of those five wounded individuals was a man named James Monroe, hmm. who that had suffered familiar. a yeah, very familiar. He suffered a nearly fatal shoulder wound. Uh, his left shoulder, he'd been shot, an artery had been severed, hmm. and one of the doctors was able to clamp it and tie it off before he bled to death. But, you know, imagine James Monroe, a future president of the United yeah. States at the Battle of Trenton. Man, we got a future president here. Take care of him. Yeah, let's, we got to save this shoulder. man. He's a future president. <laughs> uh, on the Hessian side, 22 killed, 83 wounded, and then a whopping eight to 900 captured Hessians. That's wild. Yeah, this is, That's a huge number. It's going to be, it's going to be substantial, but um, it's important to understand that all four Hessian colonels that were at Trenton were killed in the battle. So Rall mm. and his subordinates are all going to be killed. The Lossberg Regiment effectively removed from the British forces. There's that that they bagged the entire lot of them. The Niepausen Regiment's going to have some of their soldiers uh, escape to the south, but Sullivan's going to capture some 200 of those men, along with the regiment's cannons and supplies. 
they're going to capture about a thousand very, wow. very necessary weapons along with ammunition, which was in dire straits. We were in such short supply of ammunition at this point in time. The Americans are also going to capture extra stores of uh, provisions, tons of flour, dried and salted meats, ale and other liquors, as well as shoes, yeah. boots, clothing, and bedding. <laughs> Things that are very needed by this ragtag continental force, uh, weapons and horses. And it's This is like a Christmas, is like a Christmas miracle. <laughs> All right. Earlier, Bjorn, I had mentioned this talk of the uh, the drunk Germans here. So uh, an officer in Washington staff wrote before the battle, they make a great deal of Christmas in Germany, and no doubt the Hessians will drink a great deal of beer and have a dance tonight. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I just picture like, you know, you know, you go into drill or whatever with, you know, all of your army buddies and it's like, boys, you want to have a dance? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, you know, or, it's like, or it's like Sunday morning after after all the soldiers hang out sun or saturday night you know because yeah. they got nothing better to do yeah yeah because all the dancing they're doing yeah all the dancing all right however historian david hackett fisher quotes patriot john greenwood who fought in the battle and supervised hessians afterwards who wrote i am certain not a drop of liquor was drunk during the whole night nor as i could see even a piece of bread eaten Military historian Edward G. Lengel wrote, the Germans were dazed and tired, but there is no truth to the legend claiming that they were helplessly drunk. So. Doesn't give a very good excuse. You know, when you when you suffer such a devastating defeat, yeah. it's you, Maybe it you, been almost, you almost wish you could be like, well, you know, we were we were it was Christmas. We were all drunk. Yeah, we we're all <laughs> tired from dance. Yeah, we're all tired from dancing. <laughs> all right. So. After the Hessian surrender, Washington's reported to have shaken the hand of a young officer and said, this is a glorious day for our country. Uh, Washington soon learned, however, that Cadwallader and Ewing had been unable to complete their crossing. Because remember last episode, we talked about how those two individuals were going to be sending their 5,000 men across um, because there was hope there was a hope that they could continue the offensive. Um, but this isn't this isn't going to happen uh, his worn out army of 2,400 men are going to be isolated. Uh, Washington's going to realize that he did not have the forces necessary to attack Princeton and New Brunswick. So his forces are quickly going to move back across the Delaware into Pennsylvania. They're going to take their prisoners and their captured supplies with them. So it's the 26th of December. We've won a huge victory there in Trenton, looking around saying, yep, we don't have the forces to hold this position from a British attack. We need to... Mm -hmm fall back into Pennsylvania. And that's what he's going to do. And then we're going to get into the Battle of Princeton. And that's going to take place about a week later. On my birthday, January 3rd. I wasn't born in 1777, though. Oh, you'd be um, really old. I was going to yeah, say happy super birthday old. to you. But so uh, Cornwallis is like, he he hears about Trenton, right? And he's, uh, he's kind of on the hunt for Washington here, right? Oh, yeah. You can't suffer such a devastating embarrassment. Yeah. and not come after him right yeah. so, so that's that that's what you know precludes washington's move back across the delaware so how did okay so we're going to talk battle of princeton here that is also in new jersey so do you know what happens between the two battles to get the americans back up near princeton which is even further into new jersey yeah so uh what's going to happen is washington he led his army across the river back into pennsylvania and then about Three days later on the 29th, they're going to move forward into defensive positions at Trenton. Okay, mm. so he's basically going to recross the Delaware three days later. Um, on the 31st of December, Washington's going to appeal to his men whose enlistments expired at the end of the year. So like Which is that the day, next day. Yeah, that, <laughs> oh, like that crap. day, he's like, hey, guys. Um, and this is what he says. He says, stay for just six more weeks for an extra bounty of $10. Uh, so this appeal is going to work. And most of his men are actually going to agree to stay with him. I mean, um, but, that, that, that's a good plan there. Like, what else are they going to do? Like, oh, yeah. $10 like, is cold. $10. 10 bucks. We just won a whole, we got a whole bunch of salted beef. We got a whole yeah. bunch of flour and it's wintertime anyways, right? Yeah. They probably didn't realize that they were going to go right straight into battle. Yeah. So in response to the loss of Trenton, like you said, Brendan, General Cornwallis is going to leave New York City. He's going to reassemble a British force of more than 9,000 men at Princeton to oppose Washington. So and remember, Cornwallis is not happy, right? Because oh, he no. was supposed to go back to, to England uh, yeah. to go take care of his ailing wife. And yeah. Washington starts getting crazy. And Howell's like, Cornwallis, you better get back into the fight here. 
Yeah, so remember now, the British had men all over New Jersey in different outposts because it was wintertime, and so he's got to accumulate this force back. He's going to leave 1,200 men under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Mahood at Princeton. So remember Mahood. Uh, he's going he's gonna to be there in Princeton with 1,200 men. Cornwallis is going to leave Princeton on the 2nd of January. He's going to be in command of 8,000 men on his way to attack Washington's army of 6,000 troops. All right. So Washington had sent troops to skirmish with the approaching British to delay their advance. Uh, It's almost nightfall by the time the British reach Trenton and they try three times to attempt to cross that bridge over the the Assumpink Creek, beyond (laughs) which uh, the primary American defenses. So three times to try and cross the bridge. Cornwallis calls off the attack until the next day. All right. So this is where Mm -hmm. we find ourselves at the Battle of Assumpink. Assumpink. There you go. All right, you say it. Yeah, Aspen yeah. Pink Creek. Yeah. Aspen Pink Creek. Okay. So that's <laughs> real the jokes of Aspen for that name that creek. creek. Yeah. I don't know who did that. <laughs> okay. So before we get to the Battle of Princeton, let's really quick talk about what happened that night. Okay. So they're in Trenton. So we're talking about the night of January second, right? The night of January second. They're in Trenton, and Washington's there. He's got his six thousand men. They're up against eight thousand British soldiers. Uh, Washington's going to call a council of war. And he's going to ask his officers, he says, hey, we got to figure something out. We have three options. Do you stand and fight? Do we attempt to cross the river somewhere and go back into Pennsylvania? Mm. Or should we take back roads and attack Princeton? So although the idea had already occurred to Washington, he learned from Arthur St. Clair and John Cadwallader that his plan to attack Princeton was actually possible. Uh, they had two intelligence collection efforts that had that had come to fruition at the end of December 1776 that supported this idea of a surprise attack. So after consulting with his officers, the Council of War says, hey, our best option is to move around this British force and attack them in their rear at mm. Princeton. Wow. OK. So Washington's going to order that excess baggage be taken away uh, and sent back to Pennsylvania ground's frozen. It's going to make it easy to move artillery without it sinking into the ground. Uh, By midnight, they are moving. So that is something that's important to take into account here, Brendan. Many times in history, there's a council of war, and the only purpose for the council of war is so that general can be absolved of any wrongdoing should this attack or should this retreat turn out poorly. They do this all the time. Yeah. Uh, or they have a council of war, so then we can have a unanimous agreement that we should not fight and we mm-hmm. should all run, right? This is one of those times in history, one of those very few times in history where a council of war results in an ambitious and audacious plan mm. to go after the enemy. So this is this is impressive. Uh, they're gonna make they're gonna get the ball rolling so quick. By midnight, the plan's complete. The baggage is on its way to the rear. Guns are wrapped in heavy cloth to stifle any noise as they're rolling down the frozen roads. Uh, They're going to leave 500 men behind in Trenton with two cannons just to patrol, keep fires burning, uh, dig with shovels. Make it look like the army's still there. Yeah, they're going to dig with shovels and picks, making sure that the British think that that they're digging in. Um, But before dawn, those men were also supposed to pack up and head off to join the main army. So this is, I'm, I'm really impressed with the, like I said, the audacity, but also the organization, how quickly they were able to put this into, into motion. Okay, cool. Let's, uh, let's go back and just talk about the battlefield of Princeton here. Um, all right. So we're now in January 3rd, right? The, the day of the battle. Yep. Yep. Okay. So here we go. All right. Area of operations here. So West, South and East of the battlefield is Stony Brook. Stony Brook kind of like it just circles around uh, the the battlefield here where we're Princeton. Is. So we're going to be like southwest of Princeton. On the northeast of the battlefield is Frog Hollow Ravine. And then past that to the northeast where the battle is actually going to take place is the town of Princeton. On the north side of the battle is the Trenton Princeton Road running northeast to southwest from Princeton uh, across Stony Brook into Trenton. And then the battle is actually going to be fought on William Clark's Orchard. All right. So in just in terms of obstacles, the orchard is going to provide some obstacles in the form of fences and fruit trees. Uh, there's also going to be some elevation changes and vegetation that's going to restrict foot movement here. 
avenue approach, primary av- avenue of approach here was the Trenton Princeton Road, which the British were using. Uh, another smaller avenue is called the Sawmill Road, which runs parallel with the Princeton Road. And this is the, that, uh, that back road that Washington's going to take into Princeton. Key terrain. Uh, Orchard Hill that Clark's Orchard sat on was the key to maintaining position against the enemy. This is the piece of ground that the battle is actually going to be fought over. And it's the only one that I could see. Bjorn, did you see any other pieces of key terrain here? This is no, it's this pretty is small. A, it's like a tiny little orchard. Yeah, this is a wide open space yeah. in an orchard. And and it's wintertime, so there's yeah. not going to be a lot to cover. The British are wearing red uniforms in, yeah. in snow. So yeah. that's going to be easy. Yeah, so observation, yeah. Middle of winter, no buildings. Uh, fruit trees with no foliage on them. Uh, it's going to make observation really great for both sides, especially for the Americans looking at those uh, those red coats. And then well, cover blue's concealment. Not, blue's not a whole lot better. No, it's not. Cover and concealment. What is that? The Delaware River? No, it's the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> nice water joke. <laughs> yeah, coming at you like a wave. That's right. All right, so cover concealment. So the rise of the hill seems like the only real concealment to be found on that day of the battle. All right. Bjorn, that's all I got here. Let's jump back down and talk about what happens after 2 a.m. Yeah, let's talk. Well, first, let's pause. We'll talk about the forces, what we're what we're seeing here. OK, so remember, we talked about uh, the British Army. We talked about Colonel Mahood, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Mahood is commanding 950 men in three regiments. He's got four light dragoon companies. Uh, one is mounted on 30 horses. He's got one grenadier company and he's got three artillery sections with six guns total. Up against the Continental Army, General George Washington with 4,000 men. We've got the same two divisions. You've got Major General Green. He's got 1,800 men. Part of that is a guy named Mercer. So Mercer's Brigade, we got to remember him. He's got 300 men. Uh, And then you've got the Philadelphia Brigade, which is Brigadier General John Cadwallader's 1,500 men. Remember those guys. They are mostly militiamen. And then lastly, we've got Major General John Sullivan's division of 1,200 men including three divisions. So remember three brigades. Yeah. What, yeah. There you go. Three brigades. Yeah. So now let's get to 2 a.m. here on the third. The entire army is in motion roughly along Quaker Bridge Road, through which is now today Hamlin, Hamilton Township. So the men were ordered to march in silence, absolute silence. Along the way, a rumor spread that they were surrounded. So you know how soldiers like to mm-hmm. talk. Everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah. They've got this idea that they're surrounded. This is going to this is going to frighten some of the militiamen who are then going to flee to Philadelphia. Now, the march is difficult. And as some of the route ran through thick woods, it was icy, caused horses to slip, men to break through ice and on ponds. It's a miserable situation that they're finding themselves in. And it's but 2 a.m. the Revolutionary War, like no night vision, no flashlights. Uh, they probably don't have torches or anything lit. Oh, yeah. So, and the roads, like the yeah. roads are bad. The maps are are incompetent the only way you're going to be able to navigate in these these times is by finding someone who actually lived in the area yeah we're going to see that consistently throughout history prior to accurate maps prior to actual uh you know reconnaissance capabilities Mm -hmm. so as dawn comes the army is going to approach the stony brook the road the army took following stony brook for a mile further uh they go until it intersects that post road from Trenton to Princeton. However, off to the right of this road, there's an unused road, which cross farmland of this Thomas Clark. The road's not visible from the post road, ran through cleared land to a stretch from which the town can be entered at any point because the British had left it undefended. Okay. So mm-hmm. we've got some roads, uh, one of which you're able to basically move unseen. So Washington's running behind schedule. He had planned to attack and capture the British outpost just before dawn. And then his plan was to capture the garrison at Princeton shortly after dawn. But mm-hmm. by the time dawn had broken, he's still two minutes away, or two miles away from town. So by the time dawn broke, he's still two miles from town. According to the standard account of the battle, Washington sent 350 men under the command of Brigadier General Hugh Mercer to destroy the bridge over Stony Brook in order to delay Cornwallis's army when he found out that Washington had escaped. So according to a newer analysis, though, it was not actually Mercer. It was Brigadier General Thomas Milfin. Mifflin was tasked with the bridge. Mercer's forces did not break off from the main column until later. So Cornwallis had sent orders to Mahood. To, this is the British guys, remember. Yep. To bring the 17th and the 55th British regiments, so two of his three regiments were supposed to join Cornwallis' army 
the morning of the 3rd. So as the Americans are moving towards Princeton, Mahood and his men are moving out of Princeton to fulfill the orders. They're actually going to run into each other. Uh, they're going to be unable to figure out the size of the American army because of the wooded hills. Uh, Mahood is going to send a rider to warn the 40th British Regiment, the one that had been left in Princeton. Mm -hmm. Then he's going to wheel his men around, the 17th and the 55th Regiments around. He's going to head back to Princeton as quick as he can. So that day, it's interesting. On that day, Mahood had called off the patrol that would have reconnoitered the area which with, mm. with which Washington was approaching. So remember, uh, Mahood is moving towards towards Cornwallis, and as such, he says, you know what, forget about it. We're moving in that direction anyways. We don't need to recon the area prior to. Had he actually done that, he would have ran into Washington's men and been in much better position because he would have known far in advance that Washington was on his way. Never keep your reconnaissance in reserve. Always put them out before you move <laughs> two regiments. What are you doing, Mahood? Put your scouts out. God, why, why do we keep running into generals and colonels that keep doing this, Bjorn? Yeah, that's one of the biggest like you're asking you to lose. It's, it is absolutely asking to lose because you have this blank picture on a map of what the heck is going on. And then he, so, so he's, he's wheeling his two regiments around without knowing that he's wheeling them into two divisions. Yeah. So not, so here's what happens next. Mercer, the American is going to receive word that Mahood is leading his men back to Princeton. Mm -hmm. Now Mercer had moved his column to the right in order to hit the British before they could confront Washington's main army. So Mercer moves towards Mahood's rear, but when he realized that he was not able to cut him off, he decides to join Sullivan's men. Mahood is going to learn that Mercer is in his rear. He's going to move to join Sullivan and moving to join Sullivan. So Mahood is going to detach a part of the 55th Regiment to join the 40th uh, in the town. And they're going to move um, basically to attack Mercer. Now, here's what's going to happen throughout the rest of this portion of the battle. We're going to see the British uh, basically fighting American colonists in a piecemeal situation. So You've, you're never going to find a position in which you've got the entirety of the Americans fighting against the entirety of the British here mm -hmm. until the very end of the battle. Mahood's going to order his light troops to delay Mercer. He's going to bring up his other detachments. The light troops volleys are going to go high, which gives time for Mercer to wheel his troops around into a line of battle. Mercer's troops advance, pushing back the British light troops, and the Americans are going to take up positions behind a fence at the upper end of the orchard. But here's the deal. Mahood had brought up his troops and his artillery. The American gunners, although they're going to open up fire first, uh, they're going to be out. They're going to be outnumbered, uh, which is not really something you'd want to find yourself in. When right. over the entirety of this battle, the Americans outnumber the British by three to one. But in this portion of the battle, mm. the British are going to outnumber the Americans. So, not only are they outnumbered. They're also going to have inferior weapons when it comes to how quickly they can load and fire. The Americans are going to have rifles. Most of them have rifles. It's going to take longer to load than the muskets. So Mahood is not only going to be withering them with his fire, but he's also going to order a bayonet charge. One thing in which the American rifles don't have the capability mm. of attaching. So we're going to see the Americans be overrun here on this portion of the battlefield. Both the American cannons are going to be captured. The British are going to turn them on the fleeing troops. Mercer is going to be surrounded by the British soldiers. They're going to shout at him, surrender, you damn rebel, uh, <laughs> declining to surrender. Mercer is actually going to be killed. Um, the British, thinking that they had caught Washington, bayoneted him and left him for dead. Mercer's second in command, Colonel John Haslett, was shot through the head and killed at mm. this point in time. So you've got Mercer gone, you've got his second in command gone, you've got a portion of the American army in absolute chaos and retreat. So 50 light infantrymen were in pursuit of Mercer's men who had retreated when a fresh brigade of 1,100 militiamen under the command of Cadwallader appeared. Mahood gathered his men who were all over the battlefield to put them into battle line formation. Meanwhile, Sullivan was at a standoff with a detachment of the 55th Regiment that had come to assist the 40th neither daring to move towards the main battle for risk of exposing its flank. Cadwallader attempted to move his men into a battle line, but they had no combat experience. Remember, these are militia, and they did not know even the most basic of military maneuvers. 
When his men reached the top of the hill and saw Mercer's men fleeing from the British, most of the militia turned around and ran back down the hill. So there how you go. Men, how, many, how many men do we think Mer, uh, Mahood had here? Because Cadwalder had 1,100. Yeah, the the entirety of, of Mahood's The, the Americans out, would have outnumbered them, right? The militia would have outnumbered the British here, right? So Mahood has a total of 950 men in three different regiments. Right. So remember, two of those regiments are working working um, with Mahood at this point in time, and yeah. then one of them is holding Sullivan off. So it'd been like two, like two to one, basically. And yeah. then they, but and they they retreated back. Yeah. This is this is one of those situations like piecemeal, right? So you've yeah. got Mercer's men are destroyed. Cadwallader's men are now fleeing. As Cadwallader's men began to flee, the American guns opened fire onto the British, who were preparing to attack, and the guns were able to hold them off for several minutes. Cadwallader was able to get one company to fire a volley, but it fled immediately afterwards. At this point, Washington arrived with the Virginia Continentals and Edward Hand's riflemen. Washington ordered the riflemen and the Virginians to take up a position on the right-hand side of the hill, which would have been towards like the north or, nor- or the east. Uh, And then Washington quickly rode over to Cadwallader's fleeing men. Washington shouted, Parade with us, my brave fellows. There is but a handful of the enemy, and we shall have them directly. Cadwallader's men formed into battle formation at Washington's direction. When Daniel Hitchcock's New England Continentals arrived, Washington sent them to the right, where he had put the riflemen and the Virginians. Man. So imagine what would have happened had Washington not shown up at that point in time. You know, his ability to rally these militiamen, get them into line, get them moving, that, that's going to seal the deal on this day of battle. Had, had the Americans, and we've seen this in other battles, had the Americans just continued to throw their men in piecemeal, one at a time, one unit at a time as it comes up, they could have been then defeated by these more professional, although incredibly outnumbered British soldiers. Mm-hmm. So Washington, with his hat in his hand, rode forward and waved the Americans forward. At this point, Mahood had moved his troops slightly to the left to get out of the range of the American artillery fire. Uh, Washington's giving orders not to fire until he gave them the signal. Uh, And when they were 30 yards away, he turned around his horse facing the men and he said, halt. And then he said, fire. So he's got his men marching. He's, He's sitting here on his horse in the front of the American lines. And he is going to move his men forward. That is that is a general with some real cojones here. Yeah. He's right in the line of fire. But here's the crazy part. As the Americans are going to fire, the British fire as well. This is going to obscure the entire field in a cloud of smoke. So you can picture it. The Americans are in their line. The British are in their lines. They both level their, right, their muskets at each other and they pull the trigger. Smoke's everywhere. Uh, we have a story where one of Washington's officers, his name was John Fitzgerald, He's said to have pulled his hat over his eyes to avoid seeing Washington killed. But when the smoke cleared, Washington appeared unharmed, waving his men forward. Now that's the stuff of legends right there, Brandon. That most definitely happened. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, So over on the right, Hitchcock's New Englanders fired a volley and then advanced again, threatening to turn the British flank. The riflemen were slowly picking off British soldiers while the American artillery was firing grape shot at the British lines. At this point, Hitchcock ordered his men to charge, and the British began to flee. The British attempted to save their artillery, but the militia militia also charged, and Mahood gave the order to retreat. The British fled towards the post road, followed by the Americans. Washington reportedly shouted, It's a fine fox chase, my boys! Some Americans had swarmed onto the post road in order to block a British retreat across the bridge, but Mahood ordered a bayonet charge and broke through the American lines, escaping across the bridge. Some of the Americans, Hans Riflemen among them, continued to pursue the British, and Mahood ordered his dragoons to buy them some time to retreat. However, the dragoons were pushed back. Uh, The dragoons were cavalry, so they were on horse. Some Americans continued to pursue the fleeing British until nightfall, killing some and taking some prisoner. After some time, Washington turned around and rode back to Princeton. Man, Washington's at, in a real fine feather this day. You know, yeah. some of his some of his quips. It's a fine fox chase, my boys. You can just yeah. picture that. You can just picture him. He just uh, ordering his adjunct to like write down a bunch of really great lines for him to recite throughout the battle day. Oh yeah, absolutely. He prepared that. He prepared major. That. <laughs> Prepare my lines. <laughs> no. So all right. So 
uh, before, you know, we, at the edge of the town, the 55th regiment, uh, which was out, away from uh, Mahood. So we just finished kind of talking about what Mahood did. Let's go back a little bit. We'll talk about the 55th regiment. Mm-hmm. Um, they received orders from Mahood to fall back and join the 40th regiment in town. In 40th, Princeton, right? In Princeton. Yeah. The 40th had taken up a position just outside of town on the north side of a ravine. The 55th formed up to the left of the 40th and sent a platoon to flank the oncoming Americans. It was cut to pieces. Uh, when Sullivan sent several regiments to scale the ravine, they fell back to a breastwork. And after making a brief stand, the British fell back again, some leaving Princeton and others taking refuge in the Nassau Hall. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is then uh, reported to have brought three cannon up and blasted away at that building, uh, the Nassau Hall. And then mm. some Americans are going to rush the front door, break it down, and the British put a white flag outside the window, and 194 British soldiers walk out of the building, laying mm. down their arms. Was this in the play? Yeah, I don't think that was in the play. <laughs> they left that part out. Shoot. All right. So after entering Princeton, the Americans do what uh, many armies do in history. They just begin to loot the abandoned British supply wagons and the town itself. With news that Cornwallis was approaching, Washington knew that he had to leave Princeton. Uh, so now there's some some real impetus to get out of there. 8,000 men with Cornwallis. As quick as you can. Uh, so Washington, the audacious man that he is, actually wanted to push on to New Brunswick. He had heard that there was a British pay chest that had 70,000 pounds in it. It's like the end um, of a D&D quest. Like we oh, know, yeah. we know the treasure's exactly. there. We need to We need to get it. Well, just imagine if he would have been able to get that oh my God, 20, yeah. thousand pounds, how, how vital that would have been to his war effort. He would have actually been able to pay his dudes for one time. Um, Major Generals Henry Knox and Nathaniel Green talk him out of it. They say this is, you know, take your win and get yeah. out of here. Yeah. So he's going to move his army to Somerset Courthouse on the night of the 3rd. He's going to march to Plunkman on the 5th. And then he's going to arrive, arrive at Morristown by sunset the next day. And he's going to enter his winter encampment there at Morristown. Is Morristown in New Jersey or in Pennsylvania? Um, that's a good question. I'll look it up. You keep going. I'll look it up. All right. So after the battle, Cornwallis abandoned many of his posts in New Jersey. He's going to order his army to retreat to New Brunswick. The next several months of the war consist of a series of small-scale skirmishes known as the Forage War. So now, Brendan, we've got some questions here as to what the casualties at the Battle of Princeton actually looked like, because the British General Howe official report stated that he had 18 killed and 58 wounded and 200 missing. And then uh, a guy named Mark Boatner says that the Americans took 194 prisoners during the battle, while the remaining six missing men may have been killed. But a civilian eyewitness wrote that 24 British soldiers were found dead on the field. Washington himself claimed that the British had more than 100 killed and 300 captured. So a lot of questions. Basically, uh, you can think that's probably around 300 casualties, killed, wounded, or missing on the British side. Uh, Washington himself reports that he had only six or seven officers killed and 25 to 30 enlisted men. He gave no figures for wounded, so he's saying, I got 37 dead men. Uh, Although you've got Richard Ketchum, who's stating that the Americans had 30 enlisted men and 14 officers killed. And then you have the Loyalist newspaper, the New York Gazette and Weekly Mercury reported on the 17th of January that the Americans had lost 400 killed and wounded. So anywhere between 37 and 400 for the Americans. But remember, that's the Loyalist newspaper, so it's probably significantly less than that. George Washington himself saying 37 killed. So Morristown is in New Jersey. It's north, pretty far northeast of Princeton. Uh, and then it lies west of New York and then Newark. I don't know if Newark was a town back then, but uh, west of New York and then north of Princeton. So. Well, and that's one of the major significant aspects of this. Ba- the Battle of Princeton, Cornwallis is going to leave New Jersey. Mm. And then go back to New York. We, we've caught, we've captured New Jersey again for the American colonies. So that's actually pretty big. So if we do a quick recap here, kind of the key factors that led to the outcome of the battle. Again, um, I'm going to say that audacity, just George Washington's decision to attack instead of falling back. You're looking at what you've got. You're looking at what the British have. 
And instead of, you know, most generals would look at it and say 8,000 versus 6,000, maybe we should fall back. Uh, or, you know, maybe we just try and hold our position here and defend as long as we can. But instead, he decides to go on that third option and do something really audacious and slip out of slip out of Trenton, march to Princeton and attack a significantly weaker force and surprise them once again. Mm -hmm. And really set yourself up for campaigns the next year. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. With the supplies captured, with yeah. kicking the British out of New Jersey. Yeah, he's like in a good in northern New Jersey. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. He's also got the initiative here. So keeping that momentum, uh, keeping the opposition on their heels, never allowing them to catch him, but in fact, catching them instead. And then uh, Washington's ability to rally his men. So like the leadership aspect of this, you have the British significantly... Uh, terrorizing this army that's coming in in a piecemeal scenario and his leadership, his ability to stand there on his horse and say, men rally, let's do this. That's a significant thing yeah, in this huge. battle. But at the same time, the units that were thrown in piecemeal into battle that almost negated the vast advantage that the Americans held. Uh, if they were to just continue pushing into the battle in a piecemeal situation, it could have been a real sad mm. situation that the Americans could have found themselves in. All right, Bjorn, uh, that's the Battle of Trenton, I think, or and Princeton. Let's talk about the legacy of both of these. So the British viewed Trenton and Princeton as minor American victories. When they were. They were. You like, know. they were. A couple hundred men killed, wounded, yeah. and captured. Like, this is this is small sauce when we're talking about the grand scheme of things. But in the American psyche, the continental psyche, it was huge, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, the Americans now believe that they could win this war off those two small victories. American historians often consider the Battle of Princeton a great victory on par with the Battle of Trenton because of, sub because of the subsequent loss of control of most of New Jersey by the Crown forces. Other historians, like Edward Lengel, consider it to be even more impressive than Trenton. A century later, British historian Sir George Otto Trevelyan wrote in a study of the American Revolution when talking about the impact of the victories at Trenton and Princeton that... It may be doubted whether so small a number of men ever employed so short a space of time with greater and more lasting effects upon the history of the world. That was a Man, British that's a really, historian. That's a really flowery uh, sentence that if you dissect it, he's basically saying that he doesn't think there's a single time where less men have done so much more uh, in such a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. All right. There are eight United States National Guard and one active army unit that are derived from American units that participated in these battles. Yeah, so that's a nice, fun legacy. You've got a lot of a heritage coming from yeah. this and, and a lot of pride in today's military service. Bjorn, do you think the Americans took any lessons? Did Washington or Sullivan or Green or Henry Knox or any of the, you know, Hamilton or any of these guys take any lessons from Trenton and Princeton and applied them later in the war? Well, and that's one of the things that impresses me so much about General George Washington is every time he fought a battle, whether he won it or he lost it, he implemented something from that battle, the lessons learned from that battle into his future battles. So, yeah, every time Washington has one of these uh, experiences, he learns from it. So uh, one of the reasons why he is an absolutely phenomenal uh, general, phenomenal learner of history um, is right here. He's got mm -hmm. the Battle of Trenton, the Battle of Princeton, and he's going to learn from them. He's going to move on. There's going to be some significant uh, battles that take place in the future. But remember Yorktown, that's that you can't go under them, can't go over them, go around them kind of a scenario. He leaves New England and he marches down into Virginia and using surprise once more is going to bag mm -hmm. the entire army of General Cornwallis, who having fought against Washington before should, should have, have learned a lesson. Yeah. Oh man, that was awesome. Our first uh, foray into the American revolution, uh, our longest episode to date. Uh, so this was a, you know, like we talked about, this was a good value for you listeners. Uh, two, two battles in one here. Uh, thank you everyone so much for listening. Bjorn, this was great. This is a lot of fun to talk about this one. Uh, you have any other like parting words before we close this thing out? 
No, Brendan, but I think it's your choice for the next battle. Which yeah, one are we so going to take? We're going to move forward again, uh, this time to World War I, to talk about the Third Battle of Ypres, or more famously known as the Battle of Passchendaele. Oh, or as the British would call it, Wipers. Wipers. All right. Yeah. Look forward to it. <laughs> cool. All right, everyone. We're going to close this thing out. We will see you in two weeks. MMG out.